Um, hello and welcome to today's ICENTD Connect uh, webinar and meeting. I'm Marianne Compared and I'm speaking from the International Society for Neglected Tropical Diseases. We're based um, here in London. And uh, today we're going to be uh, talking about uh, research and development for neglected diseases and uh, what an incredible time it is with them um, for, for this sector and with a huge amount of change and also opportunities. And it's our great pleasure to welcome today Jamie Taylor. Um, hi, Jamie. Hello, thank you for having me. Hi, Jamie, it's our pleasure. Welcome to ICENTD Connect. Um, Jamie, you are currently with um, Riata Pharmaceuticals. Uh, you're supporting corporate communications and strategy at Riata Pharmaceuticals, which is an innovator in uh, rare diseases at the clinical stage. Uh, but beyond that, Jamie, um, you are a recognized expert in innovation uh, to drive increased private sector investment uh, and involvement in the space of neglected diseases uh, and really to reach out to medically underserved communities. And I think that we met actually while you were at Johnson & Johnson, where you established and co-founded the Global Public Health Unit. And really, this was an incredible time for Big Pharma um, when Big Pharma was really taking the steps and putting in the efforts and uh, moving in the right direction to uh, really forge the partnerships across public, private sectors, academia, uh, to expand their work and their support uh, into neglected diseases and the communities affected. So, um, Jamie, you're really um, passionate about these issues. Uh, you've worked not just in neglected diseases, but also uh, to address society, some of society's most complex challenges uh, across a wide range of topics. So it's really our honor and our pleasure to hear from you today. And uh, we look forward to your presentation and to finding out a lot more about uh, the opportunities for biopharma and R&D in this space. Um, I'll hand over to you now, Jamie. And again, from all of us, a very warm welcome to today's ICENTD Connect. Well, thank you so much. It's a real honor to be here. The last time I was speaking at ISNTD, as you mentioned, I was representing Big Pharma uh, and, and a huge player now in global public health and Johnson & Johnson. Today, I'll tilt my presentation slightly more towards small pharma. I think it's a really exciting space to be in. And it's, it's a place where a lot of this unprecedented capital attention and these swift timelines are really transforming this space as a whole. For those of you who'd like to reach me with questions after the presentation ends, know that uh, you can reach me at Jamie Taylor, spelled as is below, at uh, jamie.taylor at riatapharma.com. That's R-E-A-T-A pharma.com. Here, I, you know, I'm speaking as a longtime advocate for neglected disease R&D, and know that I'll offer a lot of opinions and perspectives, especially given the the uh, uncertainty surrounding the space that we're in and the moment that we're in. So note that all opinions are my own. I hope that you'll share your own opinions as we go throughout the discussion today. Brilliant. And uh, just to remind our attendees to definitely make use of the chat function uh, uh, on the right hand side of the screens and to ask all your questions and any comments or feedback you had on Jamie's presentation. So we'll regroup uh, after the presentation for uh, Q&A and discussion. And I'll, I'll just disappear momentarily now. Excellent, thank you. And I'll just add that it is a huge pleasure to work with ISNTD. As I mentioned, the last time that I had presented, it was a few years ago in London. And, and little did I know that as I stepped down from the stage where, that I would situate myself in the midst of such brilliant people who are advocates and scientists and big innovators in their own right. In fact, the ISNTD conference that I attended a few years ago ended up being one of the most impactful in my own professional life. The person who sat to the left of me and the person who sat to the right of me ended up being lifelong contacts. In fact, the person to the right of me uh, it ended up someone with whom my company carried out as a function of that ISNTD meeting and that, that wonderful serendipitous interaction that ISNTD made possible, we ended up doing a massive global partnership 
with that individual and the uh, and the the organization that she led. And so I know the impact that ISNTD can have. I've seen its impact on the ground. I've seen the power of this particular collection of people. So I'm hoping that even though we're virtual today, you'll see yourself as part of this discussion, sitting on the right of me, sitting on the left of me, and look for opportunities to really engage and to drive forward the community and all of its aims. And I do really see this this set of slides is very much a discussion starter. I hope that as we go through the, the perspectives that I'll offer up in this critical moment, that you'll consider what will the post COVID R&D agenda look like and how can we as a community help to shape it? I do believe it's fair to say that we're in a singular moment right now and one that has the potential to change drug development as we know it. There are a lot of forces at play, some of which have been simmering for quite some time, but haven't had the opportunity to percolate and to really coalesce in earnest. And so I do believe that because of everything that COVID has brought forward, as Cameron at ISNTD, as in our preliminary conversations about this, he talked about the COVIDization of R&D. And perhaps it's, it's, a, a challenging, it's a challenging term to consider, but as we look at the long-term and look at the long-term benefits of, of all of the transformation happening right now, I think we'll look back at this as, as a true moment and a moment of change, a pivotal shift, if you will, with lasting consequences, not only for the field of, of you know, pandemic R&D, but also for the fields in which we work on the neglected tropical disease side. So Cameron made clear to me that it was important to emphasize and to ground ourselves in the NTD road, roadmap with attention to three key shifts that are taking place or that are mapped within that roadmap. One, of course, is this shift from process to impact-driven programs with measures of success. And we'll talk about the, that expectation and how it's bound up in new players who are flowing capital into biopharma R&D right now. The number two here, I think, is particularly important and really will be the grounding centerpiece of a lot of the discussion that I'll bring forward, particularly in the latter part of my presentation. And that has to do with vertical to horizontal multi-sector approaches. And then we know the long-term emphasis in the roadmap on donor-driven to state-owned uh, efforts around NTD control. So thinking about those particular shifts as a backdrop, today I'll focus on three overlapping points of emphasis, and they are indeed overlapping. At the, at the bottom left, you can see capital, which is a point that I'll dwell on today, in part because it really opens every door. And because we see such a surge in new capital and new types of capital moving into the biopharma space, from the small pharma side, emerging pharma, all the way up to big pharma, it's just creating more opportunity and expanded capacity that allows and helps to drive faster timelines. And all of it together is bringing what I've encapsulated as just broader attention to the industry. And there are certain implications to that spotlight that I think that we as, a, as an NTD advocacy community can really harness for the future. So let's talk about capital because it is so important. And we're certainly in a moment where there's a lot of dysfunction and, and real question marks around capital flows and how they're moving and a lot of chaos, you might say, in the markets and the markets versus Main Street and so forth. And there's a lot to unpack here. From a biopharma perspective, this is, this, we've seen a certain surge here that is worth noting. We see that evident right here in just this one year graph of the NASDAQ biotech index. The biotech index is typically your emerging biotechs. They're laden with risk. They're typically preclinical. And so there's, there's, and I'll talk about this, a certain character of investor that jumps into this space normally, but you, you see right here evident, obviously the volatility in, in the market almost shattering at the onset of the pandemic, but that faith in the industry and what it can do as a solution driver 
really evident in, in the way that this graph plays out and that continued upswing. This is changing the entire space, especially for small pharma that often feels very starved in terms of its cash runway and what it's able to do and how it has to place its focus and how it maps its strategy on a company by company basis. What this new capital means in part is that it is, is it that it provides relief in a lot of ways to small companies that have had to be almost artificially focused on one particular disease state or therapeutic area, even where they've got broader platform types of science and technology. That has implications certainly for NTDs as we think about going forward. Any way you look at this, this kind of graph and this upswing, it's really positive for the space. And it again, it opens up many doors. Here we see what we often don't see, small caps build steam and biotechs remain well positioned. Typically within almost any biotech headline pre-COVID, uh, headlines are laden with attention to the risk and the volatility that's characteristic of the biotech investment space. And so to hear and to see this sense of building steam, this sense of momentum, this sense of well positioned, that's all positive. And, and again, presents some really interesting opportunities on the NTD side. So there's a saying, that, uh, at least pre-COVID, that because of all the risk and the volatility, and because of the long and torturous timelines associated with, an, with drug development, that, quote, you need body armor to invest in biotech. This is almost its own refrain in the space. And it, it, it bodes true. There's a certain character of capital that chases this particular segment and its niche, for the most part, its highly sophisticated investors and very patient capital. This is all changing and changing in ways that I think are really important and interesting. We're seeing now an expanding and diversifying universe of investors. And we're seeing this crowding in of capital like never before from corners of, of the capital, the, the capital world that just have not have not broken in, at least in earnest, to biotech. There's been, you know, pieces of pieces of this capital puzzle that have come together or started to, to really play in this space. But now we see this new energy around it. And as, I, as you see written here at the bottom of the slide, there's a new overall character to this capital and it brings new expectations. And I'll draw your attention to at least a few of these. Obviously, there's the, the institutional investors piece and the retail investors, many of whom, as I mentioned, are clad in their own kind of intellectual body armor and uh, have have that risk tolerance that's required for the space. We see a lot more public sector money is going into biopharma in a very different way. And that's important to acknowledge uh, th the ways that public sector monies are now being used to support readiness for manufacturing and not just early stage discovery. This represents a huge shift. We also see banks in Europe and elsewhere on the public sector side unlocking funds to help get drugs to the finish line and vaccines to the finish line. This kind of finish line segment, very new in biopharma, very interesting. And I definitely want to highlight a few, a few um, of these circles to the left. Private equity, and I'll speak to that in a moment. Venture capital, I'll speak to that as well. Philanthropy is moving and really in tandem in many ways with family offices, with the um, with with the preponderance of, of available family office and philanthropic wealth, we've seen an interest almost like never before in, 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 in investing in smaller biopharma and the cropping up of a set of advisors who are capable to really bridge the translational divide uh, in, in making it possible for that kind of for the comfort level required to invest in this high risk space. And, and it brings with it the spirit of ESG investment and philosophy and impact investors. And together this mix is really changing the focus and the priorities and the strategies of companies, again, in ways that are very exciting and very different from before. Capital and biopharma drives decision-making. And when the character of that capital changes, 
decisions around investments change. So I'll highlight new models uh, now emerging to finance R&D pathways with a focus on that finish line. This is my company we just announced last week, a strategic investment of $350 million from Blackstone Life Sciences. Blackstone really emerging as this major private equity player moving drugs to the finish line. Many companies, as I've mentioned, struggle with cash runway, struggle to get all the way through the regulatory and commercialization process, which is in many ways as arduous and, and nearly as expensive in some cases as, the, as efforts to bring a drug through phase one, phase two, phase three. And what's I think special to highlight here, you can see the arrow placed on the side of the slide, is what the global head of Blackstone Life Sciences said here, that this investment aligns with Blackstone Life Sciences mission to help advance promising new medicines to patients with high unmet needs. And as, as the private equity world even brings that lens of attention to high unmet need and brings the capital really designed to power something through the finish line to bring a drug to market potentially faster or more efficiently, that's when you see new models emerging on, on in, in the whole drug development ecosystem. Similarly, along these lines, as we think about smaller and, and emerging biotech and some of the adjacent technologies that support biopharma, like uh, diagnostic technologies, data science, and so forth, I see huge promise in life sciences, in the life sciences venture capital space. And whenever I need to feel hope about the future, I head to Google Ventures or GV and their website and click through their constantly expanding team to look at those who are really powering and driving capital in these important directions. I encourage all of you to go to this website anytime you need, anytime you need a sense of hope, in part because what you'll find is that the team is featured, you know, um, as featured on the left of this slide, the team is very attuned to issues of global health disparity. The team is very attuned to neglected disease. And they bring you know, in all of their multidimensionality and all of their various areas of expertise, a sense of purpose around capital, and they deploy it in alignment with that purpose. And so there's a lot to understand and to recognize within that smaller biopharma, private uh, biopharma, emerging biopharma space, a lot that's happening there, again, being driven by very purpose-oriented life sciences venture capital. Now moving on to attention, I think that you know, it, was, it was hard to find the right word for this. And in some ways, attention seems very mundane or potentially too broad, but there are certain layers to it that I wanted to bring forward in the context of this discussion. Certainly, the spotlight is on pharma almost like never before. And it's not only on big pharma as it typically is, and typically, or at least historically, or at least in recent history in a negative light. Now we see a very positive spotlight being placed on big pharma and small pharma alike. Small pharma is so much the R&D engine and so much a driver of the ecosystem. So to see small companies like Moderna, for example, suddenly splashed all over the front pages of Financial Times and Wall Street Journal, the New York Times and other major media outlets, it suggests that there's a new place to recognize the role of small pharma, the potential, even transformative potential of small pharma. And it's a place where those within the, those of us who are within the ISNTD community, it's a place for us to consider placing additional energy and attention. What's interesting about this new level of attention and something that I think is, is a net positive is that around the world now, we see among the masses, new levels of literacy with respect to the pharma business model. It is incredibly complex. It is fraught with the challenges of opportunity cost in investment decision-making, which precipitate or exacerbate problems of market failure that really plague the NTD space. And so as we, as 
the world digs into the pharma business model, we find really productive questions coming forward. Questions like, why hasn't there been a level, a greater level of therapeutic preparedness with respect to pandemic threats? Why, are, why is there an over-indexing of investment in certain areas of medicine and almost an entirely, almost entirely an abandonment or neglect of other areas of serious unmet medical need? This is really important because at, coming from farm, I can tell you that many of us in this space feel almost trapped by this business model, feel almost trapped by systemic imbalances that make and create hurdles that are very difficult to overcome. So new levels of understanding drawn from this new level of attention to pharma has by itself opportunities to drive change. Along these lines, as I mentioned, the pharma business model is fraught with imbalance and it's a product of imbalance and in many ways a perpetuator of imbalance. And these imbalances are really coming into view in tandem with with this attention. Again, a heavy investment in certain areas with high commercial value and potential, and then other areas of very serious public health need, simply not able to overcome those opportunity cost hurdles at the investment committee decision-making table. But here's a moment for industry, and all of us within industry recognize this, that as an industry that's been plagued with terrible reputation, some of it warranted, but much of it not. I, I think there's a moment here that's recognized among industry players that this industry can really emerge a hero within not just the COVID-19 story, but within this era in which we live. There are many solutions yet to be unlocked for many health and pu public health and, and major challenges with where there are glaring gaps and will continue to be. And there's a place, an opportunity, and the challenge is, can the industry rise to the challenge? And it's something at the forefront of all of our minds. So thinking about that, uh, Cameron and I from ISNTD, we've, we've talked often about the importance of, of structural incentives. He and I have had many rich conversations about the PRV and what future, the priority review voucher and what future iterations of the PRV could look like and should look like. And I've always believed in a carrots upon carrots approach. And in this particular context, thinking about this kind of hero's journey that the pharma industry is on and the struggles that it will maintain to really shed its former cloaks and really take on a new cape, how much encouragement it really needs from the broader world, not just the investor world, but the broader world of advocates and laymen and, and healthcare providers, et cetera. One thing that is very much top of mind for industry is at all times pre-COVID and since is reputation. Every company has very sophisticated social listening tools. And I can tell you that where there's positive reinforcement about a move or an investment in a particular direction, uh, whether it be in uh, traditional media outlets or some of the emerging media channels like social media, what, what we see is where there's critical mass acclaim for a particular decision to go in a particular direction, uh, inclusive of NTD research, for example, then we see the industry really following where that, that particular reputational carrot can lead. There's been a tendency in some corners of the global public health world to really bring out the sticks and just hit the industry with stick after stick after stick. But having sat in many decision-making committees within the industry, what I've found is that it's where there, where there are carrots, and again, that positive attention, that positive reputational opportunity, there's, there's, that comes into play even quite heavily as a consideration in investment decision-making. So it, it's incumbent upon all of us to consider this and to consider ways that we can draw upon a carrots upon carrots, structural and it, let's say intangible carrots uh, that can be placed on the pathway, especially to NTD R&D. So let's talk about timelines in part because 
it's impossible to talk about shifts in R&D and the COVIDization of R&D, as Cameron has put it. It's impossible to talk about it without recognizing this unprecedented speed at play. It's absolutely incredible. This warp speed movement, this idea that can a vaccine for COVID-19 be developed in record time? Certainly that's the question that all of us are asking and the answer seems to be yes. This comes from uh, Bio, the Trade Association, which is affirming that conclusion right now in ways that are very exciting. This is not just on the vaccine side. I know within the industry, both within the company in which I'm situated and in the broader corridors, there's a lot of talk about how these faster timelines can really upend longstanding assumptions about the long duration required to bring anything forward to patients. And this is very exciting to unravel those assumptions and to find new ways to speed to market is, is something that will absolutely by itself uh, transform this space. So are we at a transition point? I think the answer is clearly yes. The question will be how durable can this shift become? Can we shift from the standard model of R&D and the set of assumptions that guide it to a new era? Communities like this with, within ISNTD will be important in securing the durability of that transition and certainly even demanding that transition as we expect and as I hope investors on that capital side will be doing in tandem. It's important to recognize that there's a classic dilemma at the investment committee level in biopharma R&D, and it has to do with these assumptions and these norms around R&D. And the question that's often uttered, um, probably a, you know, a clunky and ill-suited metaphor, but one that's useful for at least our purposes of discussion today, this is the question, is the juice worth the squeeze? And I, um, I've put this kind of very traditional way of making orange juice here encapsulated on this slide for a reason. And that's because I believe that we're on the cusp of a different way of squeezing, so to speak, one that can really bring about new and a higher volume and more juice, so to speak, across a whole host of therapeutic areas in ways that haven't been conjured before. And this is being made possible by a few different factors worth emphasizing. One is simply new technologies. I probably don't have to define for anyone on this in, in this sophisticated audience the power of artificial intelligence and how it has the potential to change drug discovery and drug development. You see here the news from earlier this year in February, the deep learning model identifying a powerful new potential antibiotic that can kill many species, potentially antibiotic resistant bacteria. This was in and of itself a breakthrough. Certainly, you know, those of us who might be you know, still entrenched in um, older thinking, will, or some of us who are just more seasoned scientists may be inclined to pounce on this and and emphasize caution. And there is a place for that discussion, certainly. But to sit back and see the way that AI is transforming drug development as we know it, to see data science now elevated in every big pharma company, incorporated in nearly every small pharma company, there's just a, there's something very tangibly exciting about this that, um, that bears emphasis and certainly our own attention as a community. Uh, I often say, and um, pulling from my former chief scientific officer, Paul Stoffels at j, j I often say that the power lies in the combining of new technologies. This was a theory that, that uh, Paul had and has certainly, and one that I think offers tremendous promise as we go forward. And we see this new combining of new technologies in across many companies within the industry. BioNTech is one that I watch very closely with a particular amount of excitement in part because it has intrinsic to its model, the sense of combining cutting edge technologies and it's constantly piecing in these uh, computational discovery platforms all kinds of new mRNA-based therapy technologies and so forth, and 
bringing them together in ways that are by themselves innovative. And so there's a lot to watch in this space, not only in terms of kind of individual categories of new technologies, but the way that those are synthesized and combined to create and to accelerate uh, new therapies for the future, again, across a whole host of therapeutic areas. And behind all of this, it's worth noting that what is driving the shift ultimately in the spirit of that kind of combining is more than just technology, a new ecosystem is definitively taking shape. When we think about that second pillar of the shifts identified in the NTD roadmap, that idea of true horizontal multi-sector approaches, it's really coming to view like never before, the way that public and private and social sectors are combining, it's just an absolute thrill to see. There are certain organizations like CEPI, the vaccine organization that have been driving some of this and have laid the foundation for this kind of collaboration. But the moment that we're in right now has accelerated it like never before. Uh, the uh, Deborah Burks, uh, Ambassador Deborah Burks, who is longtime head of PEPFAR, who's played a leadership role the, for the US government and COVID-19 control, uh, Having worked with her in the past, she would often really question the saying that you know we cling to within uh, within our world, which which suggests that if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And she's always said, "I want to go far and I want to go fast. Can't we figure that out? Can't we figure out accelerated collaboration and a science of collaboration that allows for that acceleration. I think it's a challenge that we all have the opportunity to take up and really actualize in this moment and going forward. So what are the implications of all of this and what are the opportunities for neglected tropical disease R&D? This is a question I've wrestled with and ruminated upon over the last few days as I've considered this discussion. I think it's an open question for all of us. I hope that you'll provide me, whether here today, this morning, or in the discussions that we'll have down the line, I hope that you'll provide some insights here because I think this is the moment where we as advocates for neglected tropical disease R&D really have an opportunity to build out an action plan. So. Uh, perhaps with a bit of overambition or headiness, I've attempted to put together uh, some, you know, some starting frames at least, or some starting building blocks for a kind of action agenda, thinking about the future, thinking about what we're seeing now and how to create and build upon further momentum. So one is drawing upon the capital piece, and I think there's great opportunity to harness new this new and diversifying universe of capital that's flowing into biopharma. In particular, ESG capital, ESG of course standing for environmental, social, and governance-minded capital. ESG is in many institutions a kind of monitoring force and it's become an increasingly important part of how investors consider an investment decision in a given company. Are they ESG compliant? How do they score with respect to environmental, social, and governance concerns? And uh, this is ESG, the wave has been building over time, but we see it cresting in, in new and I think really uh, enthusiastic heights. Impact-driven capital is really finding its footing. There was a time years ago when impact investment as a category didn't receive the same level of respect within the whole of the investment ecosystem. It was seen as kind of throwaway money or dumb money that certainly changed. It, it carries with it now the level of sophistication that your body armor clad by a typical historical biotech investors had, and I think there's something very important there and something to be harnessed. As we think about ESG divisions within institutions and impact investors, having conversations and engaging them in ISNTD's work is an important step as we consider, again, this post-COVID action agenda. So thinking about the attention piece, I've already touched on it, but it's worth reemphasizing that there's an opportunity to advance policy and reputational incentives for NTD R&D. 
understanding that positive reinforcement that yields favorable brand equity is itself a driver of investment. Uh, reputation is, is, as it becomes more quantifiable and as social listening tools and so forth bring to the surface and, and uh, really become their own kind of advising tool for investment and decision making, we can harness this as a community and consider ways to positively reinforce the work and investments of companies that are engaged in NTD R&D. We can really build, um, build that, that important narrative about the success on a reputational basis that companies can enjoy as, as, as they engage, again, more earnestly in NTD R&D. And we can consider ways to, uh, to shift some of the sticks into carrots um, and and potentially bring about a greater shift in the in the dynamics that have historically characterized the I should say high friction dynamics that have historically characterized a lot of the global health versus industry dynamics. And then finally, drawing upon this the timelines, we can amplify a rightful sense of urgency around NTDs. We can elevate NTDs as a next proving ground and as a sustaining driver of new technologies and R&D ecosystems. Uh, it's interesting, years ago, I went to dinner with the then head of R&D at Moderna, and this was when they were just kind of a, barely a blip on the radar screen, a, a very ambitious young company with an, an interesting set of technologies, but not yet proven. And he sat across from me, I at the time representing big pharma, he representing emerging small pharma, and he said, we can do anything. Give us a proving ground. We can do it faster. We can do it better. Please let us prove something to you. And as I think about that discussion now and think about the proving ground that COVID-19 has been for Moderna, what a story. I think about this hunger that especially certain small companies with interesting technologies have, have to prove themselves and to prove out their technologies. And as we elevate NTDs as an area of priority, potentially linking arm in arm with some of that purpose-driven venture capital, for example, we can, we can do a lot to bring forward and to drive this amazing shift in, in technology, ecosystem, and timeline for the good of the whole space. So with that, thank you for the opportunity to speak and to share some perspectives. I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Jamie. Uh, that was truly fascinating. I think um, you really helped us there to unpack all the new and emergent models of financing for drug development for this sector of neglected diseases, which of course comes with its own host of hurdles and uh, many of which are very difficult to overcome, not just in a clinical sense, but then beyond that, in terms of finding the right partnerships, the issues around access and um, financing, as you've really very um, nicely explained to us, you've conveyed um, what an, ex an exciting time this is and where, uh, in fact, a whole new ecosystem is taking shape. So thank you very much for that. I think you've given a lot of our attendees much uh, food for thought and particularly on the transform transformative potential for small pharma uh, with many solutions to be unfolded uh, and unlocked in future. So uh, that's really brilliant to hear. And I guess many of our attendees are either program managers or researchers uh, really working in labs. And I think maybe many of these options would seem uh, like a completely new world. So thank you for bridging that. And those very kind words you said right at the beginning about ISNTD, that's you know, very close to our hearts, trying to make those partnerships happen. So that was wonderful to hear as well. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, oh, my pleasure. You, you've had a lot of thank yous as well from our attendees. Uh, Maria Paola Costi from uh, Unimore in Italy saying thank you for the clear presentation. Uh, there's already been quite a few uh, comments on the chat. Um, <laughs> you've certainly elicited quite a response. Um, uh, Paola, you're agreeing with Dr. Parida and we'll come in a moment to um, uh, some of the, the points that were raised by our attendees. 
And so perhaps just to kickstart uh, the discussion, one of the things, Jamie, that really came out of the reactions on the chat up until now is uh, what you were uh, touching upon. And really everyone feels that there needs to be a certain um, change in culture and perhaps the whole COVID situation has really accelerated this. But uh, Dr. Ivana haluskova balter who's tuning in from Paris, hello Ivana, uh, is really talking out quite in detail about the need for to change the culture on a political level. So first of all, have the political will to prioritize these issues um, of neglected diseases and also uh, beyond that, also rethinking and strengthening the partnerships and the dialogue to include a host of partners, including young researchers. And Ivana, you were also mentioning a change in culture about IP protection and fair dialogue at WTO and all this kind of within a framework that would be really built to promote universal health coverage. Um, so, uh, Jamie, kind of thinking about this change in culture, do you feel that uh, this is something that we still need to communicate, uh, particularly maybe to the science community that uh, out there, there are very rapid changes. You mentioned uh, warp speed uh, programs and so forth. Is that something we really need to work on from a communications perspective, that things don't always have to be done as they have been in the past? I think you're absolutely right. And I love the dynamism, it sounds like, in the chat. And I look forward to hopefully unpacking a lot of those questions and comments, uh, either in the next few minutes that we have here, or as I mentioned, in a longer conversation that I hope will continue forward. I think it's important to recognize that the dynamics and the culture will change inevitably, in part because you have these new players, this diversifying and expanding universe of investors, as I mentioned, but also as implied in the presentation, this expanding and diversifying ecosystem inclusive of, of drivers of new technology, drivers of some of the, uh, the adjacent technologies, as we call them with, within biopharma, that are as important as, as, as therapeutics sometimes or otherwise support you know, discovery development or otherwise, um, especially through diagnostics, appropriate prescribing, et cetera, and some technologies that can support better access. Either way, what, you, what we have here is a broader set of actors. So it's no longer just big pharma, as I've hoped to communicate, kind of working with and navigating with a, um, a, a rightfully frustrated advocacy community, right? And we've seen this kind of polarization and this friction, as I mentioned, really define a lot of the dynamics uh, between big pharma, you know, uh, which has situated itself very heavily in, in a classical IP position has been, has been referenced, for example, and made that a centerpiece of a lot of its own advocacy, as opposed to, you know, as, as opposed to, as I mentioned, the, you know, very access oriented, and, and please invest in this direction, uh, frustrated audience on the you know, on the, uh, the global health side. So because it's because it's not just polarization now, but because it's a broader universe with different perspectives, different types of technologies. I think that there's a real opportunity to engage more broadly, not just you know multi-sectorally in a classic sense, but multi-sectorally from an industry sense to bring in more of the small pharma voice. Uh, if you know, thinking about even that dinner I mentioned at Moderna, I mean, I almost get a tear in my eye thinking about it because here I was with someone who was taking enormous risk stepping into this position who could have had a very comfortable role at any sort of big pharma and really a lifelong role, but had taken this, uh, this very high risk role in a, in a high flying, um, not likely to succeed at the time company. But he said, he said, I'm doing this because he said his interest actually in NTDs and he'd been inspired his whole life as a young student by the Merck story of its own donations in the, in the direction of river blindness. And he, but he saw his greatest impact in small pharma. And here, here's someone who's very much in industry, but in a corner of industry that hasn't always been part of the culture and hasn't always been part of the political dialogue, for example. So as we really engage those other corners, I think we'll find very passionate advocates and points of interconnection that simply haven't been um, 
been brought forward as, as points of common ground over time. And I'll add to that just you know additional emphasis on the role of purpose-driven venture capital and how we're seeing that in even some of the most powerful life sciences VC firms taken together. And as we as we as an advocacy community develop a, a more sort of panoptic lens to our engagement, I think we'll find that there's much more meeting of the eye meeting of the minds and seeing eye to eye going forward. And that will reshape the culture as we understand it and have experienced it. Thank you, that's really interesting. And perhaps uh, another point that was raised here by uh, Dr. Um, Srimantha Parida uh, is mentioning, um, it's more of a comment than a question, but uh, Srimantha was talking about coming back to the researchers and the science community themselves. Uh, what, could we do more to raise the accountability and the monitoring um, of the use of those investments and those funds to deliver the research and the health commitments that were kind of tied into that? Is that something that could also facilitate the dialogue and then the invest the involvement, sorry, of these investors? I love the way that's articulated because it is an exact encapsulation of what ESG divisions within institutional investors, investment institutions, it's, it's what ESG investors are seeking. It's that accountability, it's that monitoring, it's that indexing, it's that ranking, it's that checking. Are you really committed to this space or is it a red carpet marketing initiative, right? Really driving, I've been at the table with ESG investors, I was starting a few years ago and the tone is so different. The push is so different. They don't accept glossy brochures and you know, beautifully taken photos in a frontier market. They don't accept that as progress. They want to see numbers. They want to see R&D investment. They want to see decision making. And they want to go deeper into a business model. And there's, I remember just sitting back and listening to an, uh, to an early ESG investment group describe these demands and feeling blown away, thinking to myself, this is the future. This is the kind of capital we want, not purely profit-driven capital, but the, the capital that looks to, for a more benevolent kind of purpose. And so ESG is really the, it's the anchor for a lot of what's been expressed in that particular comment. And as we, as we connect it more explicitly, that particular thrust to the ESG investor world, I think we'll see a lot of doors open going forward. Brilliant, thank you for your answer, Jamie. Um, we've got a great question here, looking at a slightly different sector uh, from Francis Inangale Uh Francis is a veterinarian based in Uganda. And uh, first of all, Francis is saying, thank you, Jamie Taylor. This is a great and excellent presentation. I'm a veterinarian. Um, and uh, I am praying that the presentation here and the great ideas can be mimicked for veterinary drugs, specifically looking at drugs for zoonotic diseases. Um, is there, again, a difference between treatments for humans and treatments uh, for the farming industry or uh, for zoonotic diseases? Is that something you've come across? And is there within neglected diseases a neglect, an even more neglected sector? I think those are great questions and, and great points implied in those questions. So I'll offer a few different perspectives. Um, having sat in WHO meetings on zoonotic diseases, having worked in tuberculosis quite extensively and, and understanding tuber tuberculosis risk uh, in the zoonotic context is I think something that was eye-opening for me years ago and helped me understand the, you know, the broader disease risk and drivers of that risk. What's interesting is that in the big pharma side, quite a few big pharma companies do have veterinary and di veterinary divisions. Uh, and some have been able to bridge some of those divides very capably. Some need more uh, nudging and maybe a carrot sense in that direction. Some of those divisions simply don't have um, all of the heft from kind of a hierarchy point of view um, when it comes to shaping policy positions to some of the earlier points made. So I think it's always, there's always value in really elevating that side of things. I'll also point out that there are really interesting small companies who are working in this space who really understand 
kind of eco health, so to speak, and planetary health and are trying to drive innovation. In fact, I was at a pitch competition just a few months ago where the entire focus was on ramping up innovation in zoonotic diseases and particularly in, in veterinary populations, so to speak, and using the best of drug discovery and development and all of those new tools that I described, using it specifically for that context. And I can tell you, you know, um, being situated in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is a biotech hub in its own right, filled with all of these players that I've mentioned, the enthusiasm for the model was tremendous. So as we think about, the, again, diversifying and expanding our own engagement as advocates, consider those small companies that are that are building new research models with a focus there in particular. And, and again, we're thinking about ESG investors and so forth, a lot are very focused on this environmental piece, which is inclusive of animal health and which understands really intrinsically that relationship between animal health and human health and planetary health. And so being able to harness that and to be able to advocate with that particular segment and understanding its its particular influence going forward, it allows for the connectivity among all those points um, raised in the question itself. Thank you, Jamie. And uh, you've obviously got a huge amount of experience you were mentioning sitting in on uh, WHO meetings. And of course, you've got your big pharma experience and now um, biotech kind of lens on everything. And there's a, a, a good question here uh, coming from Semu Adeni. And Semu were, is tuning in from Sokoto in Nigeria. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, is working as well in a hospital that specializes in treating Noma patients, uh, Noma being a really neglected disease. Um, and so Semu was asking, I'm assuming with that sort of experience around him, um, how could he facilitate research to promote drug development uh, and investment in a field such as this one? Uh, of course, really, you know, what could someone write in the field, in the front line of these sorts of diseases? What sort of outreach or can, could they do to highlight their work and their disease? Well, I think um, it's interesting because there's I mentioned social listening, for example. So there's this new attention and new tools available to every company to literally track every word said about a particular therapeutic area or drug development direction or the company itself. There's this tracking and aggregating tool that makes it possible for everyone around the globe to have a new a, a new level of volume, a megaphone, so to speak. And it and I can testify really that this comes to the attention of those who sit within big companies. And so using that voice and elevating it across multiple channels and modalities, I think is really important and very useful. Uh, similarly, similar to social listening, you know, which involves a lot of um, essentially commentary, think Twitter, right? There, there are also new tools that companies are harnessing to, to scan the research landscape like never before. And so wherever there's been a published article, wherever there's um, new information that's where pen has been placed on paper and documented that what used to be very difficult for companies to sort through and prioritize, now because of some of these new tools of technology, we're able to sweep entire spaces and see what has been unseen, again, from every market around the world. And so I would, I would look at this as a real opportunity, a real opportunity to, in whatever capacity or whatever place you're in, to hold up your megaphone, so to speak, and to share the story of your research and to share very generously and very openly in ways that can be swept in to, uh, the, to the attention of those who are making decisions about research directions, who want, as we saw even the Blackstone Life Sciences Private Equity uh, Managing Director express, who want to address unmet medical needs. It's really a matter of bringing it above, bringing these, um, this data uh, into, into visibility, and that's easier than ever before. That's great advice and uh, really good to know that these voices do get heard uh, right into Big Pharma, so uh, very encouraging. And Semu was also asking um, 
uh, what would is are there do you have any insights on how could we promote drug development research in the actual NTD endemic regions as well and maybe beyond that also well it, we're moving the discussion a little bit but not just the research but also perhaps the manufacturing or uh, what could could anything be done a little bit more within the endemic regions to facilitate the whole chain from the investment all the way to the research and to actual access to the treatments down the line. I'm so glad that this question came up in part because I felt like I had neglected that third pillar a bit on the NTD roadmap that Cameron had had asked me to ground the discussion in. And that third pillar talks about moving to from donor driven to state owned. And I think within that is the notion that that local R&D, local manufacturing has a very important uh, place. Uh, I can tell you that that um, I've been part of, of efforts behind closed doors within Big Pharma to, to really drive this sort of um, this sort of push into expanding capabilities at the local level within markets. Some of it it comes down to risk mitigation. Sometimes there are onerous import fees and taxes applied to manufactured innovative pharmaceutical goods externally, which create their own kind of incentive mechanism to drive uh, investment. Sometimes we see an emerging market and a frontier market uh, having purchasing power later on, and there have been efforts to really invest in, in ecosystems within those markets. So know that even as quiet as it seems, there are efforts underway. There are, um, umpteen pilots underway in some of these key markets to make that happen. And a lot of it is being evaluated even as we speak. And I'll also just cap that off by saying one thing that COVID has taught us is that we don't all have to be nested within a particular cluster and in a traditional sense in order to make forward progress. All of the accelerated timelines that we've seen actualized during this period have been carried out under a period of mostly virtual work. And so that opens up whole new horizons for collaboration outside of traditional biotech clusters and a real opportunity to really, again, pick up that megaphone and bring attention to possible places where, where innovation is happening and where it could take greater hold. Great, thank you. Um, we're coming up towards the end of the time for our webinar, but uh, there are some more questions uh, on the chat. So perhaps if you've got a few minutes, Jamie, we might take one or two last few questions, if that's all right with you. Sure, happy to do so. Oh, thank you. Uh, so Stephen Bremer is uh, working in pest control and is tuning in from Canada. And Stephen uh, wanted to ask about the level of cooperation within pharmaceutical companies. Um, would do considerations such as profit margin and so forth dictate the amount of collaboration and cooperation among existing companies? Is that kind of an issue that needs to be looked at? Uh, also, perhaps increasing that co collaboration would also uh, facilitate drug repurposing and repositioning efforts, for instance. Uh, although, of course, there are an increasing amount of innovative ways in which they can uh, collaborate in a sort of open or semi-open source model. Uh, what might your thoughts be on that, Jamie? Well, my first thought is that we'll need a much longer conversation for that particular piece, in part because drug repositioning and repurposing is a, is a real passion of mine. And I think that there are whole new models that we've yet to see emerge uh, that have you know, begun to percolate, but we've yet to see truly coalesce around that particular particular movement. And, and again, the COVIDization of R&D is beginning to test repurposing in a whole new light, and it, it opens up a lot of opportunity there. So know that uh, collaboration in this new kind of ecosystem and this new kind of inclus inclusivity when it comes to collaboration, that opens doors for, for different industries and adjacent technologies to really come into view, including in the pest control space, where, where there's been some, there's been some side-by-side -side work on the malaria side, which maybe presents a model or a template that we can move from as an industry. Uh, but I haven't seen enough kind of cross-sector, cross-industry sector partnerships. So there's definitely room to grow there. I will tell you that um, having studied a lot on the policy side, 
the pest control industry was was one that at least at, at some of the companies I've worked with that we've studied very closely in terms of R and D models and different protections and different and different um, different models in different markets and how they've comported themselves. So know that there's been a, a, a watching and analysis of, and where there's a bridging possible in the future, I think that the ground is potentially ripe. Brilliant. Um, that, as you say, we would probably need a much longer conversation to really uh, tackle all these points. Uh, you mentioned uh, the COVIDization, well, pretty much of everything. And I suppose if we're going to be talking about the shifting landscapes for any uh, public health issue, we can't at this point not finish on COVID. Uh, and so what, in your opinion, based on your experience, having seen all this unfold, uh, what do you think will stick in future in terms of uh, opportunities for people to see maybe the neglected disease space slightly differently? after this COVID experience, what might be some of the main things you would look out for? Well, I'll harken back to this, this kind of higher literacy when it comes to the pharma model, which helps all of us in pharma and beyond, because there's a questioning around the model and the way that it's been structured. We often say that we're a product not of our own making in many ways in pharma because there's so much regulation and policy shifts and legislative movements that have pulled pendulums and pulled dollars in different directions and and really forced certain strategic decisions uh, in, in many ways that go unappreciated where that model isn't scrutinized and so that scrutiny around the pharma business model opens up this questioning particularly around certain inequities and that's been very fruitful I think, and something that could and should endure for the long haul and presents particular opportunities for the NTD space. And so I hope that that as that as all of us take another lens to the biopharma space, that we'll look at it not just critically, but also a bit compassionately and understand why certain decisions have been made why certain bodies of law in the US and Europe in particular, why certain um, levels of willingness to pay for certain drugs and not others, how that shaped the, the commercial landscape and how that can all be reshaped at this moment of upheaval. And as, and as we scrutinize with a compassionate and a critical lens, I think that we can drive forward and really elevate some of those players who are positioned to drive the most change. And in this case, it may indeed be small pharma and those purpose-driven backers behind them. Fantastic. Uh, well, on those words, Jamie, uh, we'd like to thank you very much for everything that you've um, unpacked for us today. Uh, that's been really enlightening and uh, we'll keep an eye, of course, on this uh, fast changing sector and on the opportunities ahead. Uh, lots of our attendees are also thanking you very much. Uh, Franklin Aisi saying thank you, Dr. Taylor, for the interesting presentation. Uh, Samu Adani, many thanks, ma'am, for the beautiful presentation. So uh, lots of uh, thank yous here from our attendees. And uh, any comments or questions that perhaps I've missed or we didn't have time to tackle, we'll, be, we'll send it, everything to Jamie. So hopefully we won't miss any of them. And as Jamie said, don't hesitate as well to get in touch with any further comments or discussions. Uh, but from us today, uh, it's time to say goodbye. Jamie, thank you so much for your time uh, and hope to keep in touch and see you very soon. Thank you, everyone. Keep safe. Thank you.